Uh, my name is Vishna zaborski Breton, and I'm the Director of Communications with the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. And I'd like to welcome you all to the CPRA webinar on children's mental health, diffusing the time bomb. There's been a tremendous amount of interest in this webinar, and we're very pleased to offer it to you today. CPRA has hosted several webinars over the last year for parks and recreation practitioners across Canada. We've uh, had presentations on um, subjects like recreation programming in the after-school time period, as well as enhancing collaboration between recreation and sports. So for a full listing of our past webinars and to learn about upcoming presentations, please visit our website, www.cpra.ca, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to introduce our presenter today. LJ Bartle is the director of the High Five National Standard at Parks and Recreation Ontario and has been overseeing the implementation of High Five since 2007. High Five is used by hundreds of organizations in a variety of sectors, including recreation, sports, education, and public health to develop and measure quality programs for children. Recently, High Five has expanded training in children's mental health because of a growing need and demand for resources in this area. High Five National is a division of Parks and Recreation Ontario and has authorized providers across Canada. During today's presentation, there will be a number of opportunities for you to participate in the discussion via polls that will pop up or in the chat box on your screen. Following the presentation, you will also have a chance to answer a few evaluation questions. I'd like to thank the Leisure Information Network for providing us with technical support on today's webinar. Should you need any assistance, Jennifer Pelche is on the call with us. And Jennifer, I was wondering if there are any other tips that you'd like to add uh, about the polls that the participants will see. Thanks, Vishna. Hi, everyone. Um, as Vishna said, my name is Jennifer, and I'm on the call today as technical support. Um, so if at any time you feel that something's not working well with your screen or the audio has gone away, please do share those, um, those issues in the chat pod um, that it seems people are getting used to just as we speak with all this great hello. Um, also, when the polls appear on your screen, uh, some of the polls will appear at the top right hand of your screen. When you see them come up, uh, feel free to select your option by clicking on the circle next to your uh, selection. And we will automatically be able to see your selection. So there's no need to, um, to enter or submit. Just click and we'll see the results live on the screen. Some of the polls will also appear in the center of your screen. So watch out um, as they come up. And at the end of today, you will also uh, have an evaluation pop up. And then it's the same uh, concept. It will be also polls. So all you have to do is simply select your option. Um, if at any time you need to change your selection, you can just click click on another selection and it will take the place of your previous one. So um, if you have any questions or concerns along the way, feel free again to enter those in the chat. Um, and there will be some moments and some times where you will be sharing thoughts um, in the chat as well. And so it seems that everybody got a good grasp on how to do that. So if you don't uh, or you have any questions, um, you can also email me and I will include that in the chat right now. Um, and you can just send me an email directly and I can uh, walk you through the chat at that point. And that's it for me. Thanks, Vishna. Thanks, Jennifer. That's terrific. Uh, now, without further delay, I'd love to turn things over to LJ. All right. Well, thank you, Vishna and Jen. Um, and thank you for to CPRA for inviting me to speak. I'm really happy to see uh, all of you who have uh, joined us. And it's great to see everybody from across the country. I see lots of people from uh, all over, Nova Scotia, Manitoulin Island, and uh, Burr in Alberta, <laughs> and, uh, and also frigid uh, Rainy River. 
So just to let you know, it's also very, very cold here in Toronto where our uh, High Five Nationals head office is. So we share your cold pain and, uh, and um, anyway, I'm hoping that uh, we'll, we'll take you out of that for a few minutes today. Um, anyway, I think that a lot of you, as I've seen from uh, the, the numbers of people on and the participants, are already involved with High Five. But for anybody who might be new to that, just want to let you know that High Five is Canada's only comprehensive quality assurance standard for children's recreation and sport. And as you heard Vishnu say, I am the national director of the High Five standard, and High Five National is a division of Parks and Recreation Ontario. So even though we're, we started in Ontario, but then we uh, branched across the country, and we are now uh, in all provinces and territories across the country. And the reason is because quality does matter. And the reason quality matters is that people are more likely to stay active for life if they have a positive experience in sport, recreation, and physical activity as a child. And again, just some little background on why we are so committed to uh, that positive experience, that the research shows that these five principles and these three design guidelines are critical in ensuring that positive experience for children. Now today, I really want to speak about the, the key um, element of safety. And a lot of times when people think about safety, they just think about it in terms of physical safety. But what we're focusing on today is emotional safety. And we want you to know that ensuring children's mental health is just as important as ensuring their physical health. And what we know is that seeing someone walk in, a child walk in with a broken arm, you see the cast on their arm, and you know immediately what you need to do to amend the program and adjust the activities to deal with that child who's got the cast on their arm. But when a child walks in with a broken heart, that's easily mistaken for a behavioral issue. And also, they, they are sometimes isolated, and a lot of times accommodations that could be made are not because we just misunderstand what's going on. And a lot of times, often because there are young leaders and even experienced coaches are just not equipped to handle the challenges that these children bring with them. And what we know is that there's been a lot of circumstances where children are threatening to harm themselves or others and no one's quite sure what to do. So. Um, I just want to let you know that we're not setting you up to diagnose mental health uh, issues with children, but we are giving you some insights and engagement strategies today that you can use um, when you think that a child is not engaged. So just so I can get an idea of the type of knowledge that we have in the room today, um, we're going to do a test uh, for you. And so. As, the, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, the poll is going to appear in the right-hand top of your screen, and you are going to um, click the answer you think is correct. Uh, it's very important to know that all your responses are anonymous, and uh, so everyone will see the results, but they're not going to see individual answers. And if you change your mind, you can uh, change your selection. So. Here's the first poll. So what we want is the percentage of people who you think with, that have mental health disorders that could be diagnosed before the age of 25. So what do you think that percentage of Canadians that have mental health disorders, what do you think the percentage is that they could be diagnosed before the age of 25? Okay, I'm seeing lots of answers. I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes. I love your note. All right, so Sajid wants to know who's got the answer. 
So uh, the majority of you uh, said 70%, and that would be correct. 70% of people with mental health disorders could be diagnosed before the age of 25. So good one for uh, a lot of you who uh, got that. But, and for those of you who didn't, we have another one. So out of, or one out of how many children do you think are suffering from a mental health disorder? Okay, and I think we have, again, uh, a clear 63.4% or 65% of you said that one out of five children are suffering from a mental health disorder, and yes, that would be correct. All right, doing well. Now, next poll. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, Canada has what kind of record when compared to other OECD countries in the world when considering children's health and wellness? Do you have the best record, an above average record, an average record, or one of the worst records? How do you think Canada does? Okay, so 66% of you are saying that you think that Canada has an average record. Well, that's actually not true. Canada has one of the poorest records. So the 15% of you who thought that uh, Canada was not doing well in this area are correct. We've rated 21 out of 23 countries in terms of considering children's health and wellness. So an area that we definitely have to improve on. All right, just a couple more polls. So how many children do you think there are in Canada that have mental health disorders, but they go undiagnosed and don't receive ready access to appropriate treatment? So do you think there's 100,000, 200,000, 500,000, or 800,000? Okay, so close to this time, we have uh, about 57% of you are thinking it's about 500,000, and the about 33% think uh, 800,000. And it's actually 800,000. A lot of children are uh, going around with mental health disorders, and they're not diagnosed, and they're not getting appropriate treatment. So last question. How much do you think mental health disability costs Canadians every year? 4 million, 14 million, 4 billion, 14 billion. Okay, so 60% of you think it's 14 billion, and you are correct. It is a huge amount of money that is uh, being spent every year um, dealing with this. So what have we learned? We've learned that there is a need, and the need is great. So what I wanted to now give you a chance to do 
is in the chat, throw up three reasons you think children don't engage. And I will start the process by saying, a child is hungry. So why else would a child not engage in a program that's being run? So you've got a program, an after-school program, you're coaching a program, um, and there's one child who's not engaging. All right, so we've got lots of examples here. They're, they have low self-esteem, they're tired, they have no confidence, they're abused, they lack social skills, they're scared or afraid, they feel intimidated, they don't have the social or development skills necessary to engage, family problems, fees, social skills, they're being bullied, picked on, they're, they don't have friends, they don't have the parental support, they're not comfortable in the group setting, And, when, and I see that somebody's, they've mentioned transportation or financial. Um, we're saying that once they're in the program and they're there, but they're still not engaging in the program. So um, just to clarify. So once they've got to your program, but the activity is not engaging them or the leader or coach is not engaging them. So lots of great reasons um, that you've listed. They're all uh, correct. There's lots and lots of reasons why children don't engage. Um, but today, we're going to focus on two critical reasons why children don't engage. It's mental health distress or a mental health disorder. So when we talk about all of these things, I want you to think back to this list that everyone has created. And always think there's lots of reasons that children are not engaging. Um, they could just be having a bad day. And uh, so, you know, I want to stress, don't jump to the, uh, the assumption that there's a mental health issue right away, right? Always go back to this list and think about all the many reasons why children aren't engaging before you jump to this conclusion. So what is mental health distress? Well, it could be sadness, anger, or worry. And what we know um, is that the common mental health disorders, and we're focusing on ages 6 to 12, anxiety, ADHD, and depression are the most common mental health disorders among children. So distress is a normal human emotion, and it's a reaction to sadness or suffering. And it tends to disappear when the situation is relieved or the stressor goes away. A mental health, mental health distress can lead to a mental health disorder when the child can't get over a stressful situation, the, the response is not appropriate, and the problems don't even go away when the stressful situation is resolved. There's no adaptation being made. And a mental health disorder can lead to, we know, our emotional or behavioral challenges and severe symptoms that can occur spontaneously. You might think of it as a meltdown, um, social or academic struggles, and possibly the need for professional help. So children facing these challenges are a ticking time bomb, and it's critical that we reach them in a positive way. And what we know is that you are critical in helping. So the key is around resiliency, because what we know is that a child with a mental health disorder does not necessarily have poor mental health. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. Some, a child can have anxiety or ADHD and depression and still have good mental health as long as they uh, have built key character traits. And when they are able to build strong character traits, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, then they'll be able to build resiliency. And that helps them overcome challenges and stress in a way that promotes health and wellness. you can help build a child's resiliency and help support themselves through challenges. 
So we've identified a number of critical areas that will help diffuse the ticking time bomb. So the key character traits, creating a welcoming environment, having a caring adult leading the program, having engagement strategies in place, having a strength-based decision-making model for when things are not going well, and strong communication with children and their parents. So all of these elements are part of a new online module that High Five created called Healthy Minds for Healthy Children. And anyone who, uh, some of you may have taken this uh, module before, but um, if you've ever taken High Five Principles of Healthy Child Development or High Five Sport, you get access to that module for free uh, through the High Five database. So um, what I'm going to do is give you some highlights of these uh, six areas that we cover in Healthy Minds for Healthy Children. So the key character traits. Um, a child who develops these key character traits is more likely to build resiliency. And this is, their criti this is critical to their ability to handle mental health distress or mental health disorders. So let me give you an example of the ability to cope. So you're, you're thinking, OK, that's a great list, but how do I actually do that? Well, in your program, there's all kinds of moments that happen throughout the, the program. And what we're suggesting is that there are teachable moments that you can take advantage of. And for example, on this case, a player makes a pass, you're playing a game, a player makes a pass, but the pass is intercepted, and the other team scores. So what can happen is that a child who made the pass and got intercepted starts to have a meltdown. They're very upset. Maybe other kids on the team um, are being, uh, uh, they, they may be uh, saying, you suck, you can't play, we don't want you on your team. It makes the situation worse. Or the other players might be uh, helpful and telling them it doesn't matter, it's OK, we'll get them next time. So depending on every situation and the children who are in your program, you can adjust to the moment. But what you want to do is ensure that the child who is not uh, coping well with uh, a situation understands that not every outcome can be predicted. So you know, if you take the example of that player making the pass and the pass was intercepted, okay, maybe you didn't know that that person was going to come up and intercept the pass. But maybe some choices could be better than others. So, there could have been somebody else who was open, and it was less likely that the pass would be intercepted. And you can have the child think about, what options would I do? So what would I do next time that would be different um, that, than what I did this time? And what did I learn from this situation? And what would I be able to, um, to do in the future to help me cope with this situation better? So what that does is put the leader or the coach in a position of, instead of trying to um, just manage a meltdown, it's an opportunity to actually move the child forward in their ability to cope. There's not always, um, there's not always going to be a perfect answer for every uh, situation that comes along, but I want you to always think about what what could I do, and what key character traits, if we go back to this list, what key character trait might the child be lacking that is, is creating this issue? And how could I work to help them develop that key character trait so that they could then handle this situation better in the future? And that is a key element of developing resiliency and helping the child uh, move forward on their own. The best thing that you can do when working with children is help them help themselves. We don't want uh, it to just be going in and solving everything for them. We want them to be able to do it on their own. 
and this is key, is as adults, often we want to just go and fix everything, but it's critical to their development that they can actually uh, fix it on their own. All right. So what else do we want to make sure is in, the is in place uh, to help a child? Well, it must be a welcoming environment. It must be a safe place, and again, both physically and emotionally. There has to be supervision by a caring adult, and there has to be opportunities for learning in some way. So the caring adult, and for those of you who have ever taken High Five training in Principles of Healthy Child Development or High Five Sport or Quest, we always reinforce the importance of a caring adult because we know that if a, if a child develops a relationship with a caring adult, it can help them overcome almost anything. They're just having that person that they know is there to listen to them is critical. And of course, if they're providing a positive model, uh, role model and relationship model, then that's really great for the child to help them through any stressful situation that they could be going through. To know that there's someone who they might see on a weekly basis or if they're lucky on a daily basis that they can go to to talk about some of these things is really important for children. And really, you do not want to minimize the, the um, you don't want to minimize your role in creating those relationships and those experiences for children. So when you have a child who might be difficult to engage, there are many ways to engage or, or interact with that child. And what we know are some engagement strategies can be better than others. So again, we want you to be doing some, uh, some activities here. So what we have are a number of engagement strategies. And what we want you to do is rate the engagement strategy as a red, a strategy to avoid, a yellow, that this would be something you may want to try, but you might want to be cautious, or a green. And this one, you would say, this would be a good strategy to try. So this is a child who is not engaging. Um, he, the child is in your program, and you're trying to figure out how to engage that child. So we, what we know is that some will work better than others, but there's a number of things that people try to do when a child is not engaging. And by not engaging, they might be standing off to the side and sort of being alone, but they also might be creating a disturbance in your program and uh, engaging others, but not being engaged with the activity. So when we say they're not engaged, uh, it could take um, multiple formats. So we'll bring up the first engagement strategy, and I want you to click on red, yellow, or green, or not sure if you're not sure, to say whether or not you think this would be, what kind of strategy this would be. OK, so yes, we started with an easy one. <laughs> Focus on the strengths and potential of all children. And yes, that is green, so very good. All right, so next strategy, labeling children. All right, yes, everyone uh, just about thought that um, 
it was red, and you are correct. Now, I noticed that a couple of people did pick yellow, and I have heard people say, but what if the parent comes in and says, my child has ADHD, and, um, and, and you know, they may not uh, be engaged in this activity. Is that labeling children? And what we would say is, yes, parents would come in, and, and it's great when they give you some knowledge about their child and give you some insight and say, uh, you know, here are some issues that we've dealt with, and uh, I know my child has difficulties here or with this activity. Um, and that information is very good. What we would not want is that you are using that as a strategy in terms of saying, of telling others and identifying that that's the key issue. That's, that's, we're, not, we're not saying that that's what you have to address. We're not addressing the ADHD. We're addressing what other things are happening that are causing the child to not engage. Because being ADHD mean, does not mean that the child will not engage. So that's why that's, uh, that's a red. All right. So the next one, adapt your approach to the unique characteristics or needs of the child. And I see an example from Lisa um, saying that having ADHD is not the same as being ADHD. And you are absolutely correct. So thank you for um, clarifying that and ensuring that, again, um, it's not something that we want to focus on. And uh, we want to focus on, again, developing the relationship with the child and looking at, again, on this answer, the unique characteristics and needs of the child and adapting whatever you're doing because of those unique characteristics and needs of the child. Uh, every, every child uh, living with ADHD has unique characteristics and needs. And so again, developing relationships with the child will help you understand what you need to do to change that approach. Okay. And then the next question, being control oriented. So, oh battle between red and yellow, and yellow seems to be winning on being control oriented. So I would anticipate, and feel free to write in why you think that uh, um, being control oriented is, uh, would be yellow instead of red. as I see multiple attendees are typing. Yes, and as a teacher or staff that you need to control over the program in order for the program to be successful and having routine and having a plan and some need routine and structure. And then David saying depends what's meant by control. Example, uh, are you given or the inability to cope, for sure. And what, um, what would that mean for the child? And yes, the ones who think that this was read as interpreting as being controlling the child and being over-controlled, um, that can be a problem. And actually, this strategy is actually a red strategy. Um, but only when we're talking about not being open to 
um, two options. So if you are too focused on controlling uh, the outcomes and controlling the actions of everyone and not being flexible, that's when um, it can be a red strategy. So c control oriented in this instant really meant um, not being open and uh, not having the flexibility to change the activity, to, um, to adapt activities, to adapt to situations, to run with things if they seem to be working well, things like that. So it is, uh, it, these are sometimes, again, uh, people think, well, if I have good control of the group, then I'm going to manage any uh, behavioral issues that come up. But sometimes it can also uh, squash any flexibility that comes with that. And there aren't opportunities to help children move through potential time bomb areas. So that's why we would say it's a red. So thank you all for your responses. OK, another one, assuming inclusion. So what I mean by this is that you are assuming that everyone will respond well and include everyone else. All right. And so now I've scared you all, and you all think that it's a strategy to avoid. However, um, we, have meant th we have made this yellow because the experts say, if you, um, if you know that it's a small group, and you know those other children really well, it could be an opportunity to uh, ensure that the child uh, is taken care of and nurtured by a group. Um, where we would be cautious of this strategy is if it was a group of children that you didn't know well and uh, you were dealing with a child who wasn't engaging and you assumed that if you put them in this one group uh, that all the children would welcome them openly and it would all uh, be very well received by all around. So what we know is that that can often be the, the case. And you would know that if you had been working with these children for a long time and you had a good relationship with the other children who you were then going to uh, put the child who's not engaging well with. So I hope that was, uh, that was clear. But Essentially, it can be a strategy to move a child into a group where you know that they will be well received and included and feel welcomed. Um, but don't ever assume that children will just respond the way that you hope they'll respond. You need to definitely know that that will happen. Finding and fixing what is wrong with the child. And the battle continues between red and yellow. And we often see this with this one about finding and fixing what is wrong with the child. Um, I think that what happens is, as adults, we often are trying to look for the answer. We're desperately trying to find out what we can do better and how do we fix. But really, what we want is that we're not looking for you to find and fix. 
we are looking for you to engage children. And, uh, and we would also say there's nothing wrong with the child. We are, um, we are looking for strengths always in every child. And so, you know, we're not trying to fix anything. What we're trying to do is help children develop resiliency so that they can manage their own crises when they come up and be able to um, manage their own stress and situations throughout their life. And I see uh, Tracy has made the comment, we are not therapists, and that is absolutely true. We're not, um, we're, we're not trying to equip you to be a therapist, although what we know, again, is as a caring adult, children will often come to you and confide in you and tell you things and make you feel like you know you should be a therapist for uh, for what they are um, talking to you about but what we're going to do today is talk you through so if that happens then where do you go with that so we would say that we don't want you to look for anything it is a red yes and um, but what we want you to focus on is developing the relationship with the child. So give children options even when options are limited. Yes, everyone's got it. It's green. So always have options. Options are great. Okay. Did I go back? Oh, yes. OK. So that was great. And uh, I'm glad that thank you for all participating in that and adding your comments as we went along, because I think that adds a lot. Um, I, I speak about this topic a lot. So it's, I, I've heard a lot of discussion around this. And I know that sometimes it's difficult for people to try to see what their role is. And um, again, I just want to stress that we're not asking you to become mental health experts at all. Um, we just want to set you up for success to engage children. So there's some red strategies. Those are some more yellow strategies. We just gave you some examples. And then there's other green strategies. So what we know is that some engagement strategies may work better than others. So you may try something, and it worked, and you think, I'm awesome. This is no problem. I have this. And then the next time you try to do it, it won't work, and you'll get frustrated. So just know that some engagement strategies are going to work right away, and others will take more time. And every child is unique. And this, the key is to build a relationship with them so that you can know how best to help that child. So w I mentioned earlier that you need to know what to do next. So what is a strength-based approach? So it is looking at each child and identify their strengths and build on them. So focus on engagement strategies that have been successful and find good in the worst situation. There's always a way to look on the bright side. And I would encourage you to Always think, um, how could this work in the child's best interest? What do we have to change to uh, make this better? So I have one more activity for you. And we have a strength-based decision-making model that experts developed because what we knew is that sometimes there's nothing more you could do. Engagement strategies are just not working. And you may be faced with unsafe behaviors. So the child, again, may be threatening to harm themselves or others. And so we wanted a model that you could think of, OK, what do I do first, and then what, and then what? And, and what, is, what is sort of the key order to operations that will be most successful? So there's five steps in this model. And your uh, task here will be to read them Read each one and decide, would this be the first step or the last step? Or would it be the second step or the third step? And work on 
figuring out what things you would do first, et cetera. So I'll leave you to read all those and try to put them into the order that you think the model would go in. Okay, so 97% of you said that the first step would be that the leader or coach uses strength-based strategies to engage and influence the child. Yes, absolutely, this is the first thing that you would do. And then 87 or 88% of you said that the second thing you would do is that another leader or coach would try to engage and influence that child. And the reason that is, is that it could just be you. And, you know, uh, we often don't want to think that it could be us, that we have the best intentions. But really, we would want to ensure that uh, there was just something that wasn't going on with us that was, uh, was having a negative effect on the child. So we would invite someone else to try working with this child to see if there was another result. All right, and then 90% of you said that the next step would be that the leaders or coaches talk to a supervisor, parent, or support person for guidance and try again to engage and influence that child. And sometimes people think that that uh, would come after invite the child, parents, guardians, and other agreed upon people to hear the child's story and agree on alternative strategies. But the reason we would not do that, and 87% of you are correct in saying that you would go to the supervisor, parent, or support person, because often what happens is the leader will come to the supervisor and say, you know, this child is not engaging, and the, and the supervisor says, oh, I forgot to tell you, uh, the, the parent actually made a note about uh, something that happened. Uh, last week and I was supposed to let you know. So again, you wouldn't necessarily just jump to the parent immediately. Um, you would look at your, you would talk to your supervisor and let the supervisor know that there was an issue and find out if there's any other information anyone has uh, before going to the parents and, uh, um, or in an official way. So the fourth way when we would invite the child and the parents or guardians and other people to hear the child's story and agree on alternative strategies is different from the third step which where you would just talk to the parent. So that would be, the, the third step would be much more informal and you might see the parent uh, after the activity and you might say, um, you know, I've noticed that Maria has been doing this. Is this something you've noticed at home? And uh, the, the other way, the fourth way, is a much more formal uh, approach where you're bringing everyone together and you're, you're inviting the child to um, tell their story. Now, sometimes people say, well, haven't you, why wouldn't you talk to the child earlier? Well, of course you have. And in terms of the first step of using uh, strength-based strategies to engage and influence the child, we're assuming that you have tried to build a relationship with this child and that you've, you've tried to find out what's going on with the child. So this would not be the first time that you have ever had a conversation with the child when you're at step four. just want to clarify that. And then, of course, step five is, if necessary, advocate on behalf of the child with family or additional support from trained professionals. So what we know is that you could do everything that was uh, in your power, you could try very hard, you could be the most caring adult, but there might just be things that are out of your control, and you have to know that there is um, you know, additional help out there um, for you. 
And we would encourage you to, uh, as an organization, have a strategy of uh, support contacts that could be happening. Um, and, and that would also uh, come after you've had a discussion with the parents in step four and potentially um, you know, find out if, if, uh, what else is going on with the parents, if the parents have ever uh, thought about this, and, um, but not, you, know, you, wouldn't tech, you wouldn't bring it up in front of the child. Um, you, would just, uh, you would hopefully hear more things that were going on and get the idea whether or not they'd even uh, gone down this road. So I think that um, you have the ability to uh, learn a lot uh, through these five steps about the child and what could be working for them to engage them. And, uh, and I hope that gives you um, some steps that you could try in the, in the future if you run into these difficulties. Now, one of the most difficult things that people will say um, is, well, having that conversation with the child and their parents um, about a sensitive topic like this could be very difficult. So, we would give you these sort of bullet points to say, start with the positive, always talk about um, you know, the great things that have happened, and you know, find something. Again, we go back to always find a good, the good in the worst situation. So always start with something positive, and then use a joining statement. And what I mean by that is you know, what I used earlier. Uh, I've noticed that Maria responds this way in this situation. Is this something that you've seen at home as well. And provide your observations very openly and honestly. You know, just be clear about what's going on and uh, non-judgmental, but just say, this is what I'm observing. And have an open discussion and try to uh, remain optimistic that you will be able to come up with a solution. And then apply the solution. And the very important thing is once you've all agreed on a solution, and it's very important that the child has agreed on a solution, if you're working with, directly with the child, um, make sure that they're invested in that solution and that they are uh, contributed to that. Then you want to definitely monitor and evaluate how that's going. And you may have to do it again, but it will get easier as you go. So these are the key uh, things that you want to do when you are um, having discussions that could be uh, difficult with children and or their parents. So again, an important reminder, you're not a mental health expert and your job is to foster healthy child development, not label and diagnose children. Um, I just want to give you a little couple seconds worth of background on how we got here. Uh, Dr. Kelly Leach, who's now an MP, uh, actually wrote a report called Reaching for the Top, and it identified children's mental health as a priority. Uh, the Ontario Government Healthy Communities Fund uh, agreed that this was a need, and so we ended up being, bringing, being able to bring together the mental health expertise of Dr. Stanley Kutcher and Dr. Wayne Hammond to create uh, healthy Minds for Healthy Children. We've had great uh, feedback on the online module that it has um, been able to help people uh, um, understand uh, children's mental health issues better and be able to use it. Um, these are some of the comments that we've heard um, from people who have taken our training. And a key person that took part in our training uh, was Kelly Anderson, who's the executive director of an organization of parents uh, whose children have mental health challenges. And what they are saying is that you see, their kids have been kicked out of every program they've ever tried to join because no one knows how to manage them and, and adapt and be able to, um, you know, develop relationships so that the child will stay. And so uh, Kelly's response was that she's hoping that uh, as more people you know, take our training or become more aware of what they can do to include all children, 
um, and understand that often mental health uh, challenges hide themselves in other uh, behavioral things that people misconstrue. Um, she's hopeful that as knowledge grows around that, the, that their children will be able to participate more in sports and rec. Uh, so as I mentioned, High Five Healthy Minds for Healthy Children is a free online training module that you get if you've uh, taken one of our frontline leader courses, uh, the Principles of Healthy Child Development or High Five Sport. And that is, is because um, we didn't want to just put it out for everyone because we want people to take a foundational training. Uh, so you need to know the foundations of healthy child development because this one takes it to the next level. So if you don't even know how to be a caring adult, we, we're not sure that you're going to be able to uh, um, be able to engage uh, children who are uh, in distress or have a disorder. So we want to make sure that people Everyone has the, um, the foundation. Uh, it also includes a downloadable resource uh, for additional support that you are able to um, access once you've um, got access to the online training. So thank you very much for attending. And if anybody has a question, I am happy to answer. Thanks. Excuse me. Thanks, LJ. Um, and while we um, take maybe uh, one or two questions, I'm mindful of our time, I would ask everybody uh, just to take a, a moment to fill out uh, the evaluation questions. And, uh, and um, I appreciate that. So if anyone does have a question, feel free to type it into the uh, chat. Otherwise, you can also um, contact LJ with her on the contact information page um, for further information about the High Five training. And I see there's a question from Marco uh, asking about how to uh, get access to the free online training. And uh, if, you, uh, if you go into your High Five uh, account on the database that you would have a lo oh, you don't have your login. That's the problem. OK. So um, actually, if you um, Send uh, Jennifer uh, an email um, if, if you have Jennifer's uh, contact information up. Um, she can pass that on, uh, and we will. Um, you can send your email, and um, yeah, thanks, Jennifer. If you send your email and that question, um, Jennifer will pass that along and uh, and ensure that you are um, you, you can get access to your your online training module so thank you everyone I'm very happy that uh, a lot of you uh, got a lot out of this and um, I'm happy that uh, hopefully that you have some more strategies that you'll be able to use um, when you're dealing with children next that's great. And on behalf of the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association, I'd also like to thank LJ for her time and her excellent expertise on this um, subject. I think it was a, just a terrific presentation. So thank you very much, LJ, for all your time. I think that we've all learned a lot. Um, and certainly there's uh, many strategies out there through High Five to help, uh, to help out with uh, children who are suffering from mental health distress or disorder. Um, so I would like to thank you, everyone again for participating in this webinar, and um, a recording will be made available uh, to everyone who registered. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day.